Christmas season, that we would somehow, as Christians, could we lead in hushing the noise of this hateful world so we could hear the angels sing? Turn back the strife and listen as heaven rejoices yes. as we celebrate the birth of our Savior.
Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you, Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you, Lord, that there is nowhere we go from your presence. Thank you, Lord, for coming and living on this earth and bringing us the sacrifice that was needed for sins and for restoring your creation, giving us the ability to seek salvation and eternal life through your blood. And so, God, we give this day, we give this time to you. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, a little different uh, order of service today, all right? So I hope, you know, I know that the only person who loves change is a wet baby. But uh, we're going to change anyway, okay? Uh, everybody here and online, uh, this is the second part of uh, this Christmas series. And so uh, last week we talked about worshiping God by lifting holy hands unto Him, okay? Kids, by the way, if you're going to children's church, you can go now, okay? I think your teacher is ready for you, all right? So last week we talked about being able to lift holy hands to God as a gift to Him, as, as an act of worship. And so I, I hope that uh, you just, you took some time this week to just worship God and just give Him the gift of lifting your hands to Him. Next week we're going to talk about pouring out our hearts and then, and then uh, just uh, the 20th of the Sunday before Christmas we're going to talk about bowing our knees to Him as, as an act of worship. Uh, but... Uh, Today I want to talk about something that it's really a powerful way to worship God, and that is, as the wise men did, bringing our gifts to Him, okay? In fact, we're going to start right there in Matthew chapter 2. We read the verses, but uh, we read several verses there, and, and, I'm, and I'm going to go other places uh, throughout the Bible today also, but uh, verses 1 and 2. Uh, remember, it, it says this, it says that after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the time of King Herod, Magi came from the east, uh, from, you know, that Magi, you know, wise men, okay, uh, from the east, and, and they, they asked this, they said, well, where is this one who has been born King of the Jews? Where, where's the one we've been anticipating uh, for, for decades? Uh, where, where is this one for millennia we've been looking for because we want you to know that we saw his star in the east and we have come uh, to worship him. And so uh, it, the reason the wise men took this trek was to worship Jesus. Now King Herod, bad, bad guy, okay, evil, evil guy, he, he was suddenly afraid that, oh my, somebody's come to take over my kingdom. And then he was threatened. And so he kind of lied to them, and he said, uh, hey, you know, guys, I really don't know where he is, but if you find out, would you let me know? Yeah, just because I'd like to worship him too. Yeah, sure you would, you know. So, and, and verse 9, these were really wise men, see. Uh, after after leave, fleeing, uh, hearing the king, they went on their way, and, and there it was, it says. Wow, wow, there it was. The star they had seen in the east, and it led them until they came, it came and stopped over the place where the child was. So they saw the star. They followed the star. Now we read that verse. I'm not sure we grasp the magnitude of that. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I might have grasped the magnitude a little bit watching the movie Forrest Gump, maybe. Uh, they traveled from Persia, uh, we know it as Iran today, all the way to where Jesus was, a distance, believe it or not, of about 900 miles. Now, the airlines and Amtrak were shut down. Yeah. Probably COVID. Yeah. 
Yeah. And for some reason, somebody hadn't sucked any oil out of the ground yet, and so their cars weren't working. So uh, here are these, uh, these wise men. You know, I don't know if we, if we understand that, you know, just growing up the way we grew up here in the Central Valley of California or where I grew up in Oregon. Yeah, I, I'm thinking, you know, a few years back, uh, uh, Mark and Kim went to the Tostitos Bowl, you know, about the first year. Is that, yeah, that was in El Paso, right? So if they would have walked... You didn't walk, did you? No, they didn't walk. Okay. I think they flew or something. But, but if they would have walked, they would have covered about the distance of the wise men. Okay? And they would have been tired when they got to the football game. Okay? <laughs> and we would have missed them for a lot longer period of time. So, you know, it's, a, it's about the same as walking from here to Seattle. And so, you know, it's a long, painful journey that they made just to worship the Christ child. That they believed to be the Savior of the world. And verse 10 shows us, it says, when they saw the star, when they saw the star, wow, wow. They were what? They were overjoyed beyond measure. Wow. In fact, I just want to, that's just a word. It's really, you know, overjoyed beyond measure. It's really a word that we don't have any way to translate into English. And so we have a hard time. The Greek just it doesn't match up with us there. Uh, another version of the Bible translated says, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Yeah, well, that's, you know, that gets pretty close there, too. Uh, it's really, they rejoiced with a great, big, humongous joy, you know? Uh, I mean, that, that's what it means there. They're kind of like compounding joy upon joy upon joy, you know, where you're just and it, it's like we're happy about being happy that we're happy that we're happy that we're happy we're here. Okay? It's just almost in, impossible. The, the writer's trying to describe how full of life they were because for centuries they had hoped that this would be the group of wise men that that, that that one day they would meet the one who was born who would save them from their sins. And so from the depths of their soul there's this huge, humongous uh, uncontainable joy. Here's the problem with some of us Christians today. I think, I, I know a lot of Christians, and unfortunately, I think many of us are underjoyed. Uh huh, yeah. I, I think we're underjoyed. Yeah, you know, we're in the, you know, we have a high unemployment rate. I think in the Christian church we have a high unenjoyment rate. Okay? We should be the most overjoyed people around, and I think some of us are underjoyed, and it makes no sense to me to think about the fact that God who loved us and did something that we can't earn, did something that we don't deserve, the fact that anybody would ever sit around as a Christian with a sour puss look on their face. Right? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, to come to worship looking like they're mad or upset about whatever, and, or with a critical heart, or angry about everything, or nitpicking everything apart... Could you do something for me? If you are overjoyed because Christ came at Christmas and because he loves you and because he's forgiven your sins, could you just tell your face? <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, being a Christian, we should be more full of joy 
than anyone else in the world. I mean, it doesn't matter how bad life gets. What is life? You have the promise of eternity. <laughs> I mean, he, you have a God with you, a God who is working in all things to bring about good to those who love him, to those who are called according to his purposes, a God who is greater, who is ever-knowing, who is ever-present, who is all-powerful. Wow! Don't you dare live under joy. Smile. I mean, clap, worship, and, and praise. Be fun to be around. Yeah. I, I mean, you be known for what you're for, not what you're against. You be full of love. You be full of grace. When people say, see you, they should say, you know, did you see that guy? Did you see that gal? They're one of the happiest people I know. Why? We're overjoyed. We have a Savior. Our sins are forgiven. We're overjoyed. Okay, back to the story. They traveled 900 miles or so, and, and they couldn't wait to worship him. So what did they do? Well, verse 11 says, well, on coming to the house, they saw the child uh, with his mother Mary, and what did they do? They bowed down. We're going to talk about that, you know, a couple of weeks. So, and, and they bowed down, and what did they do? They worshiped him. Now, how did they worship? I want you to watch very carefully here how they worshiped Christ. They opened their treasures... And they presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They were overjoyed to bow down and worship and bring gifts to the one who would save them. They were overjoyed to give. They, they didn't give underjoyed. <laughs> no. They weren't upset saying, man, i got to give, you know. There wasn't anyone going, well, you know, I don't really like you. They told me in Sunday school I had to give you something, and so here I am to give you something. There was none of that. It was an overjoyed sense. I get to give. And that's what they did. They gave gold, incense, and myrrh. It's been debated for centuries as what the gifts actually meant, you know, what they symbolized, and the general thinking is that the gold represented his kingship, you know, king of kings, uh, lord of lords, and, and the frankincense, many people uh, feel that that just represented the priestly role in, in ministry as it represents frankincense, actually uh, represents prayer, okay, and the myrrh actually was an oil that was used to prepare bodies for burial. And so uh, scholars believe that that was given to him, foreshadowing the fact that Jesus was born to die. And they worshiped him. And they were overjoyed to bring their gifts as an act of worship and to kneel down. And with tremendous joy in their hearts, they opened up the best of what they had and they gave their best to the Christ child. Now, you can probably tell where I'm going, you know. What I want to do is encourage you. You know, where I, uh, Esther and I have been out shopping and things. We've, we've purchased a few gifts and things like that. But we have not yet purchased a gift for the birthday kid. You go to a party and take gifts to everybody but the birthday kid? You ever do that? We, we try not to, okay. Uh, but, you know, what I want to do is encourage you, bring your gifts as an act of worship to God. 
Last week we talked about lifting up holy hands, you know, and we're going to talk about pouring out our hearts and things, but as, as some of you are going, well, you know, here we are. Yeah, I came on giving week. Every year the church talks about giving. You're kind of like, well, maybe you say, I brought a friend and brought him on this week. Oh, man, you know. Oh, man, what kind of stuff is this? So let me tell you, I totally understand that because I used to feel that way. Oh, no, it's another message on giving, you know. And uh, you know, I have to buy Christmas gifts, there's bills to pay off, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I used to, honestly, I used to resent that. So, you know, and I went to church because the reality is I wasn't really a joyful giver. <laughs> okay? Uh, that's it. As a matter of fact, I'm hardly a giver at all. And over time, God changed my heart. Now, honestly, I just love messages on giving. Uh, I love them. I'll tell you what else. I love food pantry days. <laughs> I love them. I listen uh, to people who are generous. I love being around generous people. Why? Because generous people love giving. And there's nothing more blessed than to give. Uh, I mean, in fact, I, I can always tell when I'm talking about generosity, um, uh, there, there are people who are like, yeah, they're like, yeah, they're, they're smiling, they're going, yeah, and there are other people like, you know, get me out of here, could the rapture come now, you know, uh, I mean, you know, so uh, I don't want to deal with this kind of stuff, so, and, and what I want to do is I honestly hope that over the next few minutes, uh, the whole Spirit of God will start just working in, in your hearts and lives, and if you don't love giving now, that by the time you leave, you'll say, man, you know, I want to be a giver. I, I'm going to love, I'm going to love giving. I, I'm going to look forward to giving. Uh, and, and I'm going to make a plan. It's going to be strategic. I, I'm going to be overjoyed to give to God, you know, who gave me everything. Why should it be this way? Well, I tell you what, here's what I've learned. Love gives. Love gives. When you love someone, you give to them. I mean, Esther can tell you, you know, at Christmas time, most years lately, we, we talk a bit to each other about doing, you know, maybe, no, well, we aren't going to buy any, each other any gifts this year or whatever, you know. And, and you know, we have everything we need uh, and more. God has blessed us, you know, so much. And, and so, uh, I mean... And the things that we would want are more than we can afford anyway. So they're out of there. So, but I usually break our talk, our rule every year and buy her something anyway. Uh, so, you know, so, so uh, she knows I'm crazy about her. I love her, can't stop. So, I, I mean, I just do it. And so she's like, you know, I thought you weren't supposed to get anything, you know, and, and then I get her gift, you know, that you know, I thought you weren't supposed to, you know. So, so anyway, so then lately we just, when we're out shopping, we just see something we both like, and, and so, we, hey, let's buy that, okay? And then we wrap it and put it under the tree, and we don't use it till Christmas, and we act surprised in front of the kids when we open it up. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, so that, that works, because that way we always get what we need and want. So, yeah, so anyway. So it's a whole lot different, though, than a lot of guys I knew, you know, growing up. And, and uh, they'd, they'd want to date this girl, and they'd, you know, really. But when Valentine's Day came around, they always broke up, you know, because uh, they didn't want to buy her anything. <laughs> so, uh, they're cheap, you know. <laughs> Love isn't cheap, okay? Love gives. And what's one of the, what, one of the most common verses in the Bible? What, what's, a, what's the most common verse in the Bible? John 3.16, right there, Yeah. And what does John 3.16 tell us? I mean, even if you're not from church all your life, if you watch football, you know what John 3.16 says, right? God so loved the world, he... Yes. Love gives. God gave. He loves you so much. Not gold, frankincense, and myrrh even. He gave his only son for you. 
Because love gives. God looked down at creation and he realized we separated from him by our sin. And the only way to make that right with him is if someone innocent would die in our place. Someone who had no sin. And so Jesus became flesh and dwelt among us in the person of Jesus Christ. Lived a perfect life. Died. Rose again. So that anyone who puts their faith in him would be saved. Wow. Love gives. That's the example God set. We love God because God first loved us. Love gives. When you love, you can see it in the lives of people because love gives. In fact, Romans 5.8 says this, but God demonstrates what God demonstrates his own love yes for us while we were still sinners when we still didn't deserve it Christ died for us God didn't shout love from heaven hey I love you down there no that's not what he did no he he sent Jesus to die for us because love gives. My parents, both my mom and dad, were tremendous givers. My dad, more than most people I know, like uh, he, considered, he considered nothing to be his own possession. And so, so you know, he gave, gave all the time. He was always made sure everybody knew that everything he had was simply on loan from God. And so when I grew up, I constantly heard my dad, he'd give money to some person, you know, and he'd say, now, you know, watch how you spend that money. I know you're in need, but you watch how you spend that money because that's not my money. I'm giving you God's money. And he'd just, I'd say, well, how do you know he's not going to go buy a bottle of booze? He says, well, I don't, but it wasn't my money, and I let him know. And so, you know, I just, I go, well, Dad, I could use 20 bucks, you know. <laughs> so I, <laughs> he knew how I'd spend it. So, <laughs> so, yeah, so, but, you know, he'd, he'd loan out tools. Okay, yeah, it's not my tool, it's God's tool. So, you know, just treat it like it belongs to God. He got his tools back, you know, and in good shape usually, yeah. And so, uh, now, he, he, you know, remember to treat that like it belongs to God. It doesn't belong to me. You know, so, I mean, love gives. Love gives. Love has loose hands. God demonstrated his love for us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So now as I talk about this, some of you probably say, well, I love God, but giving's hard for me. You know, I just like to give, but you know, there's this financial pressure. There's this, all this, you know, I understand that. I'd love to, but I'm afraid, or, or, or I'm hesitant, or I'm kind of reluctant to give. Let me read to you my dad's favorite verse, okay? This was his, his verse. He always quoted it to me as a kid over and over and over. Sometimes I didn't like to hear it, but now I love it. Yeah. Very popular passage of Scripture. Uh, people don't really understand this falls within the context of it, well, all that falls within the context of this worldwide known verse. Proverbs 3, uh, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. I know you've heard this before. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. Okay? Trust in God. Don't lean on your own ability to understand. Trust in Him. Trust in Him. Trust in Him. And then it goes on. You see, the thing is, there's more there. It says, don't be wise in your own eyes. In other words, don't try to figure it out. There's a higher way than your ways. And God says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So verse 7 says, don't be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Now in the context of trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, Solomon says this. Honor the Lord with your wealth. 
honor, that word there, means to worship. So Solomon says, worship, praise, honor the Lord. With what? With your wealth. Worship God with what you have. This is only one of the ways we worship God, but it's a very important way to worship God. And, and where they were overjoyed. They opened up their treasures, and they worshiped him. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. <laughs> first fruits. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Honor the Lord, worship the Lord, and then you will be blessed beyond measure. Honor him with the first fruits of your wealth, Solomon says. Now, some people say, okay, well, you know, we do a different type of economy nowadays. We're not, you know, farmers, all of us who are out depending on trading our farm goods for whatever to keep us living. So sometimes we don't understand first fruits. But what are first fruits in our day and age? Well, the first fruits, even in their day and age and our day and age, is the tithe. Okay? The tithe is a Hebrew word, and uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a different word, uh, masar, and it, it simply means a tenth. That's all. It's just that simple. It means one tenth. And so Malachi says that we worship God with a tenth of what he trusts us with. We bring him the first portion of what he gives to us as an act of worship. And Malachi says when, he does, when we do this, God opens up the windows of heaven and God pours out so many blessings on us that we don't even have room to contain it. Man, have we witnessed this with our food pantry. And so we worship the Lord with the first tenth of what he gives us. Now, in my mind, that sounds crazy. And for many years, I thought the same thing that some of you are thinking. Ain't no way I'm getting hit by that pitch. 10%? No way. It's absolutely crazy. I go back to what Solomon says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of what he blesses you with. I kind of like to say it this way, you know, maybe it makes a little more sense to me, is we bring our first and our best and trust God to do the rest. Okay? We bring our first and our best, the 10% of the first, not the last 10% if it's left over. The moment we're, ble we're blessed with increase, we bring God our first and our best, and we trust God with the rest. And I, I, not being judgmental, I just look around and see the tithers now, you know. Uh, because, you know, they're going, yeah, they've had experience. They've go, yeah, you know, that works. I've done that. Uh, you know, it's 90% is greater than 100%. 100% without God is not as much as 90% with God. I guarantee you that. It's just supernatural. I don't know how. Now, I'll be real honest with you. The first time I tithed, well, I didn't actually tithe. Uh, I heard, a, well, earlier on maybe, but I'm thinking about a later time in my life, that I, I heard a message on giving 10%, and, and I figured, well, you know, I helped a friend who was in trouble, and, uh, and I gave a bit, this, uh, this preacher on the radio, he, he was a lawyer in Eugene, and he gave out uh, tapes to people, and so I gave him some money, you know. And, uh, and I bought lunch for a homeless person, and uh, I gave some money to a missionary, you know. I didn't understand it. I didn't understand that, uh, th that we actually bring 10% and return it to the storehouse, which is the local church, the place where we're nourished and we're fed, and where we get our spiritual bread and grain and, and gain spiritual life, and that, that we make a difference in the world as a church all over the world. And so we return 10% to the storehouse. And so 
you know, as a kid growing up, I tithed because mom and dad said I had to, okay? And, uh, but when I began to control my own money, uh, I quit and I got used to not tithing. And, and then after I came back to the Lord, I was working at the mill and I was married and I had a house payment and uh, I made what was a lot of money for me back then. And I heard this message and I thought, okay, now I- I'm going to do this and I'm going to do it with the right attitude and this is going to be an act of worship. And-, and I wrote out what seemed to me like the biggest check in the world and I remember putting it in the offering plate with this sense of, well, it was almost, it was almost like a thrill for me then because I was following through. I was putting my money where my mouth was, and I literally, you know, put it in there going, God, I'm trusting you, <laughs> you know? Uh, because I was like most Americans. I was living I was living at a higher level than I was earning, <laughs> okay? So, so I'm going like, God, I'm believing you, and uh, this takes faith, and I'm going to trust you. And as God is my witness, from that day, I have never gone hungry. I've never lacked for things I really need. There's a lot of things I want, you know. Uh, but, and then we went to Bible college, and I had no money. God provided in every instance. Yeah, a wife and two kids. And, and people who I hadn't worked with in years sent me commission checks. For money, they discovered they owed me that I didn't even remember. Me, and God provided at every turn, miracle after miracle, and, and I can trace every financial blessing that we have today back to that check that I said, "God, I'm going to obey you, and I'm going to trust you." Give God our first and our best. Trust Him to bless the rest. Now, I'm not saying if you tithe, you're going to get a new car, okay? Now, I'm not a prosperity preacher. I think that's taken people totally away from the Bible. What I'm saying is that God proves Himself faithful. It's, It's the only place in all of Scripture where God says, okay, test me. The only place in the Bible God says, test me. If you don't believe me, test me. Test me. Worship me in this way and see what I'll do for you. I'm overjoyed to be a a tither plus a giver. I'm overjoyed to give offerings. Esther's overjoyed. We love to give because this all, it goes to people who are in need, both here and around the world. And I, that's why I'm glad to be a part of a church that does missions work. And, and I love to give above the tithe in offerings to the food pantry and to missions and to Sunday school because it helps people here and all over the world. And I like to see people reached and their needs cared for. I never sit around saying, well, some people, they don't even know we gave. Yeah? Some people, they, they don't even use it properly. Some people, they don't even appreciate it. I love to give. Why? <laughs> Let me give you just one reason out of thousands. Years ago, the Gideon organization placed a free Bible in a World War II serviceman's footlocker. My dad was in the brig in Japan, and he was bored, and he had nothing to do and nothing to read, and he remembered there was a little book in his footlocker. And in that army jail cell in a foreign country, because someone loved to give, my dad's life was transformed by the living word of God. And he was overjoyed. And I am here today. The Gideon started giving away Bibles in 1908, and so far they've distributed over 2 billion Bibles around the world. I'm overjoyed with everything in me at their generosity. 
because they lead the way with irrational generosity. They truly believe it's more blessed to give than to receive. I, I never once say, I don't want to tithe. I, you know, man, I could use that money for... I love to return to God because God has blessed me so much. I love to give beyond that because God is so good. Love loves to give. But it's more than just giving wealth. And that's really important. Look at what you do with your money, and it's an indicator of where you're at in your heart, period. And there's, there's no argument to that, really, whatsoever. We honor God with our wealth, but the ultimate thing that we give is way beyond that because we are to give our lives. We're to give our lives. It's what Paul said, and, and, and don't forget who Paul was. If you're, you know, if you're not a Christian or you're a new Christian, uh, Paul hated Christians. Yeah, and if you, if you hate Christians, Paul hated Christians more than you do. He killed them. That's how much he hated them. And, and so, but he was transformed. The guy who was imprisoned, beat, tortured, and killed Christians was so transformed by God, this is what he wrote. He said, he, he said this, he said, Brothers and sisters, because of God's compassion toward us, wow, listen to that, in view of what God did for him, in view of who God is, and what God did for us, he said, I encourage you to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Not just your wealth, that's easy. That's a starting place. But our whole lives dedicated to God and pleasing to Him. This kind of worship, what? This kind of worship, you can say it with me, is appropriate for you. Yeah. It's trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. It doesn't make any sense in my mind, but in all ways I will acknowledge Him and He will make my paths straight. I will honor Him with my first and my best, and I will trust Him to bless the rest. Because the wise men were overjoyed at a Savior. Because God loved first. Because He demonstrated His love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And so these wise men traveled far and hard to open up their treasures, to kneel before him, to worship him. We love because he first loved us. You here? You online at home? Yeah, you know, we just want to take a moment and we're going to pray. Father, I ask that in your presence you would do a work in our hearts. Lord, giving wouldn't just be something that we do, but it would be a reflection of what you have done in our hearts. And God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to this church today, not, not even just to individuals, but that you would move us as a church, God, to be more generous in all that we do. I know we pat ourselves on the back because of the food pantry and things like that, but God, we can be more generous, and you're showing us that we can. And so, God, we, we, we need to recognize it is truly more blessed to give than it is to receive. And so, God, I pray as you move in the hearts of those who have heard your word that every single one of us today would give something. Many may have been encouraged to give their first tithe ever. I don't know. Uh, but we're going to give you our first and our best, and we're going to trust you to give the rest. For some, maybe it's five dollars, maybe it's a dollar, maybe it's a quarter, I don't know. Lord, just encourage each person today to give, and for that I give you thanks. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, Kim's going to come, the ushers are going to come, and we're going to receive this morning's tithes and offerings.
Amen. Thank you. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up, and I'm going to ask you to respond today. The altars, I want you to know, are open. If you need to pray, take time to pray. In other words, just respond in, as we worship God here in, in music and respond to His Word. Amen.
our blessed Savior has surrendered all. All to Jesus I surrender may be saved. what you give that's what we owe him is our very lives so father I thank you today you're changing hearts your Holy Spirit is speaking to us and so God I pray as we give it would be out of a heart of worship for those today, Lord, who are giving, maybe uh, thinking of giving even of the financial part for the first time, God bless them. But God, may, may it go deeper than that. I pray for lives fully committed and fully transformed to you. That your faithfulness shows itself in ways that we can't even imagine. And so, Lord... For those who have said, God, I want you to have my whole life, I surrender it all. I give it all, not just the money. I give it all, God. It's all yours. I pray you would reveal your goodness to them. God, thank you. You've given us a chance to give back as you gave everything that first Christmas and that Easter through your son, Jesus Christ. May we recognize your gifts in Christ's name as we worship you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you.